Hello friends of the T-Woods, Jill Ragoon, back in business. And I hate to break it to you guys, but if you just followed along the one hour episode of uh, creating an account system and you think you're done, well, you're not. Uh, if you don't care about server-side development, if you don't care about accounts and you're just some client-side whatever developer, you can skip this episode. But if you followed along the last episode, created a basic account system and you think it's fully functional and you want to roll it out on some public servers with actual users playing on it, I highly, highly recommend to you to watch this episode and think about the security implications, something as complex and critical as our account system comes with. Okay, so wh wh what is he talking about? Well, in the interwebs, you kind of want to expect that at some point someone walks around and has malicious intents and tries to break your server, tries to hack you, steal all your bitcoins and try, tries to attack other users that signed up on your account system. And our account system, well, it's functional as long as everybody behaves nicely and, uh, well, it can break if someone tries to break it. So in this episode, we're trying to make it less hackable. Well, security, exciting. Anyways, so um, let's get right into it. Wait, before we get right into it, maybe let me quickly mention that I published the code from the last episode on GitHub. So you can go to github.com slash children slash keywords. And as you remember from the GitHub episode, we have a branch here. So my master branch is up to date with uh, vanilla upstream. So that's not very exciting, but you can type in my mod in here and click on branch my mod. Here we have the commit accounts. I will link this specific commit in the description. And uh, well, you will be able to just have a look at the code that we wrote in the last episode. You can just copy it over. Make sure if you copy it that, well, does it select the pluses? No, it doesn't. Awesome. Okay, so you can just copy over the, the code and uh, well, get it running. Uh, well, I highly recommend you to type it out yourself and watch the episode, but what, what can I do? Um, okay, by the way, you can also press the letter T if you're in this view of GitHub and it will open a file finder the same way as it does it in VS Code uh, with the shortcut Control P in VS Code. So type in T and you have this file finder and it's also a fuzzy uh, file finder. So you can fuzzy type in some stuff like a crackhead so you can type in gym controller cpp and it will find the file game controller.cpp because it includes the letters gmc in this uh, order okay and then you can scroll to the bottom here and you can find all my code from the last episode the login and the register command all in once not in a git diff maybe that helps you to steal my code and make sure to also copy the corresponding header file and so on but uh, yeah anyways have fun stealing some code. Okay, so let's get right into it, open the code, and let's have a look at what could possibly go wrong. Let's open the file game controller.cpp using uh, control P, and uh, right at the bottom of the file, we have our login and register command that I just showed you on GitHub. Well, if you don't, follow along the last episode or steal the code. Awesome. So let's have a look and recap how this whole account system worked. We have a register command which takes two parameters, the first one being the username, the second one being the password. And well, this is user input and the user input can be picked freely by the user. And in, well, in software, it's common practice in a server client environment to treat like the user input as something dangerous and you kind of want to validate it before using it. Um, so what's the user input? Well, the username, for example, is a user input. And what do we do with it? We uh, append a .txt at the end of it, and then we create a file uh, with that string as the file name. So the user could essentially pick a file name on our server. Well, we force it that it has the extension .txt, but it's still bad because the user could type in some spaces. Well, parameters in uh, chat commands are separated by spaces, but if you use quotes, you could like foo bar. Now the username is foo bar and the password is bar and it has a space in here, so that works. Okay. And file names with spaces are annoying to work with, so that's an annoyance for the server administrator. But uh, there's also worse stuff than annoyances. And that is, for example, as you can see, the buffer that we use to format and append a .txt on the username is only 128 characters long. 
So I'm not quite sure how much space you have in a chat command, but if it exceeds the 128 characters, the username could pick a uh, the user could pick a username that is 128 characters long, and then the .txt won't be able to fit in the buffer anymore. And since string format knows the size of the buffer and it will null terminate it for you if you exceed the length, it will just chop off the .txt and the user could freely pick a file extension. That's bad already. And there's also shenanigans that could happen. A user could type in slash register dot dot slash foo, which will then become a path because it will go one directory up and create the file foo.txt not in the current directory, but one directory up. Or the user could type in, um, well, data slash foo, and it will look for a folder called data and create a file foo in there. And it will be just annoying and stuff could break, whatever, if maybe it's some user that has a name with a slash in it and it has no bad intent, uh, then stuff could break. If it's a malicious actor and he knows what he's doing, he might be able to override your config he might be able to break stuff. And that is bad. So you kind of want to make sure that the files end up in the place you want them to end up in and that they cannot craft some, well, crazy ass uh, file names, including special characters that might break stuff. Um, so that's why you want to validate the characters that are in the username to be only same characters that you allow and you want to uh, make sure that it's not too long and also maybe not too short because you could also like do this and this will use a empty username and uh, detect bar as the second parameter so then you have a file that's just called .txt and well it's bad it, it doesn't look good so um, you kind of want a minimum length and a maximum length for username and password and for the username you also want to validate the characters being used um, for the password, I highly recommend you to not limit the characters because, well, passwords should be complex and if a user wants to pick a, well, crazy complex password with the special characters, let the users do that. That's good for security, not bad for security. Okay, as long as you don't use the password to do something with it, like create a file uh, based on that password. Okay, so how do we do that? What do we start with? Let's start with validating the size. Um, so pick one size for a password and username. Uh, let's say the maximum size is 100, 100 characters uh, because that's a nice number that, uh, that can be displayed to the user. And we also have to make sure that all the buffers that we use uh, exceed that length. So this buffer is 128 characters and there's also another one in player.h that is username and password. Those are also 128 characters. Awesome. Um, it, it doesn't hurt to make them a bit too long. Also, if you think about it, if the buffer is 128 characters long and the user has a username that is 128 characters long as well, stuff would still break because strings in C++ are terminated with a null byte and that null byte has to be inside of this buffer. So. Um, you need one space and one element of that array to be the null byte. Otherwise it's unterminated and then stuff goes sideways real quick. So um, make sure that your buffers are always one character longer than the actual string that you want to store in it. We have it like 28 characters longer, uh, longer just to be extra safe. Uh, that's the reason, um, well the reason for that is that I like to use multiple of, multiples of two for like uh, sizes of arrays. I don't know, that's just something I picked up. And um, yeah, so I don't want to advertise to the user that the maximum length of a password is 127 characters. That just looks odd, so let's use 100. Okay, so how do we do that? We compute the length of the username using string length, then we pass in the username and it's in the variable p result get string zero as you remember you know that's coming from the chat command and if that exceeds the length 100 um, well it can be 100 inclusive otherwise if you want to have it maximum 99 characters you can you use a greater than equals but we want a greater than so the password and username can be 100 characters 
but not 101. Then we want to yell at the users and uh, abort execution. Return, awesome. How do we yell at the user? Let's copy this line and say something like, um, username can not be longer than 100 characters. Okay, awesome. And we also want to have a minimum length. So it should be longer than whatever. What's the same length? It should be longer than two characters. So minimum three characters. Well, otherwise it's just too easy to guess to, well, it's, it's just weird to have a super short username. So um, let's force that minimum length on the user and say, uh, username has to be at least three characters long, right? Okay, and then we do the same with the password. We replace the get string zero with get string one, which is the second parameter, which is the password. And then we have the same length requirements. So, well, maybe let's make the password a bit longer because if a user has a password that is only three letters, that is not very secure. So let's make the password, what can we force on the user? Let's make it five. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's still not very secure, but um, you gotta keep in mind that users that use a chat command to register an account, they likely forget their password and maybe you want to allow them to have a short password so that they can remember it and they have to type it out because they don't know how binds work. So keep that in mind. But of course, well, it's a general security practice to have a password that is at least like eight or nine characters long, but uh, let's not do that. And uh, well, it's not PayPal. We are just coding some account system. Okay. Um, so that is good so far. And then let's do something else because we kind of want to validate that the username is only, well, containing letters like A to Z and the numbers zero to nine and maybe an underscore and that's it. No dot, no slash, no special characters, just to be sure. How do we do that? We iterate over the username. Mm, I would like to store the username in some variable so that it's uh, easier to do so. So I create a um, pointer to a character, which will be called p username. The p stands for pointer. And we get the variable p result, get string zero, which is the username. So this is just a rename of this variable, basically. So we take this string and put it in this variable. And then what do we do? We iterate over that string using a while loop and we say while and then a condition. And as long as the condition in this while loop is true, this code will be executed. And the condition will be while p username, which means that the pointer is not a null pointer. Um, so we can also type in while it's unequal to null, but I like to keep it short. Um, and while the dereference of that pointer, so the value it's pointing to, which is a character, is not a terminating null byte. Then we increment the pointer p username in every iteration. So what this does is we point to the first character. So we have a pointer, a const pointer, which means that we can't change uh, the string and it's pointing to the same memory address as the parameter the first parameter is doing and we point to the first character of that string and then we say hey is this a null pointer um, if yes then we do nothing and we abort and uh, we also check if the point well if the value the pointer is pointing to <laughs> is a null byte so note the dereferencing star here which will take the value of the pointer um, where it's pointing to. <laughs> um, if that's a null byte, then uh, we also abort the while loop. If it's not a null byte, well, we can actually also do it like this to be consistent. Well, or let's be explicit. So we say this is not a null byte and this is 
not a null pointer. Then we go into the loop and then we increment the pointer, which means it will point to the next memory address, which will be the next character in the string. So that's the way we can iterate over a string in C, for example. Uh, there are many ways, but that's just one way. And then what do we do? We want to check if the dereference of that pointer, so P is a name, that is the actual character we are currently iterating over, is um, greater than the letter, well, greater and equals than the letter A. And it should also be less and equal to the letter Z. So what this condition does is we check, we also dereference again. So P username is a pointer. So the value of that variable is a, uh, is a memory address. And if we use the star, we dereference it. It means that we have the value at that memory address. So that will be the character of the, the string. So this condition will be true if the username or the current character of the username is in the range of A to Z. Okay, awesome. So then we want to wrap that condition in parentheses again and copy it over. So that is a valid character in the username, but we also want to have capital letters. So we do a capital A and a capital Z. Then we also want to do the same thing for, well, now it gets a bit messy. We can do a line break in here. That's totally legal. Then we do the same for 0 to 9. And let's also allow the character underscore explicitly. So if the letter is in the range from A to Z lowercase or A to Z uppercase or 0 to 9 or the letter un uh, underscore, then what do we do? We increment uh, the P username and go to the next letter and do the check again, right? But if it's not matching that, then we want to yell at the user and say, hey, you used some character that is not in this range and well, that's illegal. Okay, so we do a return and abort the whole function. Okay, and we yell at the user and say something like, whoops, and we say something like, wow, this is also getting long. Let's do some line breaks. Usually in uh, C++, you can replace spaces with uh, line breaks. That's totally fine. Okay, so uh, instead of saying the password has to be at least five characters long, we say um, username has to be alphanumeric. <laughs> or is that too technical? You can also say username uh, has to be uh, Username can only contain letters, numbers, and underscores. That's maybe more user friendly. Okay, so now we should have solved the attack vector of controlling file names, since well, that's that's totally fine. A user can't escape this uh, this jail, so to say. Um, using only those characters and a limited length, we are pretty safe from the file name aspect. Okay, and regarding passwords, while we are not too safe, uh, users could still try to attack others if they have bad and short passwords. Uh, yeah, so maybe improve the password security a bit as well. So common bad passwords are the username. So we also don't want to allow users to have a password which is the same as the username. Um, well, how do we do that? We do a string compare. We negate it because if it's equal, it will be zero. So we do if exclamation mark string compare, then we take the p username and p result get string one, which is the password. So if the password is the same as the username, we also return and say, hey, that's not cool, man. 
and then we copy this line here and say the user um, username and password have to be different right okay we could also go in here and do a string compare with common by a password such as one two three and uh, one two three four five and password or whatever and force the users to not use super bad uh, passwords that are commonly known uh, but let's not do that for now um yeah okay so um, let's test the code if it even works if it even compiles we wrote a lot of code it's likely it doesn't compile wow it compiles that's awesome let's see if it actually works and create some accounts so if I now try to register an account that has the name foobar and the password bass, it says password has to be at least five characters long. That's awesome. So we do register foobar and there's password uh, one, two, three, four, five. Awesome password. Account created, you can now log in. Okay, that's working, nice. But if we try to register a empty account name and uh, a long password, it says username has to be at least three characters long awesome and if we try to register something that tries to escape the file path and tries to uh, hack everything whatever and a long password it says username can only contain letters numbers and underscores awesome so now we kind of validated all the input well let's try how long can you do some input is that over 128 characters oh yeah it looks like then we need some space for the password. Username cannot be longer than 100 characters. Awesome. So we kind of got all the cases covered and our account system is definitely more robust now. Okay. So what else can we do? Oh, by the way, so if we, if we look in our current directory, we have all the accounts I did tests before with the uh, character add and uh, all those. You can see we have our source directory here, storage here, the T-word server, and next to it all those accounts. Uh, that's a bit messy. You definitely want to have your accounts in your own directory. So let's do that real quick. How do we do that? We just provide a path on here. Wait, where do we format the... In here. So we say, um, how do we want to call the directory? Let's call it accounts and then slash. So this will now write the account file into the directory accounts and then slash username.txt. We also want to read it from there, accounts slash. Any more occurrences of uh, file IO? Let me think, yeah, in a controller. Uh, in the my mod controller we also did it here so we do accounts slash so there are like three places where we interact with account files on login on register and on logout so on disconnect cool oh and please keep in mind when picking a path to your accounts directory that this path combined with the maximum length of the username, the .txt extension and the null byte should all be fitting into the buffer you defined. So the buffer I defined is 128 characters long, my maximum username length is 100 character. So we are left with 28 characters for the file extension, the path to the accounts directory and the null byte. So we should be good to go, but yeah, just keep that in mind when like picking a file path. Then this directory, if it does not exist, it uh, won't be created and it will just fail. So that's bad. So every server administrator now has to create this directory before running the server and that's annoying. But t code gets you covered. You can press Ctrl Shift F and search for uh, what is a common directory that is being created. Demos, for example, and in storage.cpp you can see um, that in the initialize method it's called in init not initialize whatever um you have some code that is being run when the storage system is being initialized 
and it will create uh, some paths for you. So we have the dumps, demos, demos auto and configs directory that is being created on client and server start. So these directories will be only created if the client is starting. Uh, we can put it down here, just copy the line and create a folder called accounts. Okay, so that is that. Okay, there's one more thing that would be nice to be solved and that's brute forcing accounts. Because as of right now, there's no rate limit on how many attempts you can do with a wrong password and username combination. So an attacker could just try out everything and eventually, given the bad passwords that users pick, the attacker will find some valid credentials. I mean, how many tries do you need to guess the password 123 and the username being the in-game username or whatever, right? So we kind of want to do something about that. But it's tricky because, well, what some websites do, for example, is they track the amount of failed login attempts in their account. So, well, we could go to the to the game controller and if the user logs in, and if there's a wrong password, we go to the account file and increment some variable in there and say like, hey, there are X many uh, failed account logins on this account and if it exceeds a value, we freeze it. The issue with that is if the username is known and some troll just enters some wrong passwords or some attacker tries to hack that account, the account gets blocked also for the true owner. And then the true owner has to go to the admin and be like, hey, someone froze my account, I'm the real owner, please can you unlock it for me again? And then the admin has to figure out, hey, are you really the true owner? And then it gets tricky and it's overhead for the administrator. And even if that's solved, what stops the troll or attacker to freeze the account again? So that's not really an option in this, uh, in this case. And the other alternative is to track the failed login attempts on a per user basis. So we could, for example, go into the player.h, create a variable in here and call it int m underscore login attempts and increment that every time this player enters a wrong combination of username and password. The issue with that approach is that if the player reconnects, the C player instance will be wiped out and the login attempts will be uh, starting to count from zero again. So one can just reconnect to uh, reset the amount of tries. Well, I mean, it's better than nothing, but it's actually not solving the issue. So the way you should do it, the best way to do it is track the amount of login attempts on a per IP basis. So every time a user tries to log in, you say if it's IP address, and uh, how many attempts this IP address had. Then when the user reconnects and tries to log in again, you increment the value. And this way you keep track of failed login attempts across reconnects. But since this is a complicated concept and I'm not going to cover it in like uh, this episode, uh, well, we will implement a naive implementation and force users to reconnect. Actually, I think the recon password login attempts work in a similar way. They also don't uh, store it on a per IP basis. I'm actually not sure, to be honest. I mean, we can, we can quickly give it a try. So let's run the server and let's run the client and let's say it the other way around. So if I try to enter a wrong recon password, I have like three tries. And if I reconnect, it starts from zero again. Do you see that? So that is kind of bad because, well, you can just reconnect and try more passwords. But the connecting step also takes some time. So it reduces the amount of speed you can use to uh, try out all the combinations. It's way faster to uh, just spam and stuff than to reconnect. Uh, but yeah, it's still it's still an option to, to brute force that. Okay, so uh, let's implement that naive implementation, uh, but keep in mind, it is still possible to bypass it. But uh, nevertheless, let's do it. So let's go to uh, player.cpp and inside of the constructor, so the function that is called cplayer at the bottom of it, uh, we add our login attempts and initialize it to zero. So this code will be run if a player connects and a new instance of cplayer will be initialized. So we uh, start counting from zero for every new player. And then in the game controller in the command login, 
every time it says wrong password, we go to the P player and uh, increment that value of failed login attempts. And then uh, on the top here, make sure after the line uh, where we initialize the variable P player, we check the variable and we be like, hey, has the player more than whatever two failed login attempts? And then we just abort and say like, Uh, too many failed login attempts. So now if a person tries to enter three wrong passwords to any given account, he won't be able to log into any account anymore and then is forced to reconnect. Okay, well instead of printing a message and not allowing the user to log in again, we could actually also ban the user. That's the way it's done for the too many recon attempts. The user will be banned. And the easiest way to ban a user actually is to run it like it was a admin executing that command. So let's steal some code. We can search for quotes, ban, and then space. You can see in gamecontext.cpp it's being done. The second occurrence where it says string format a command, uh, there is a ban command being crafted. So let's copy those three lines and put it in here. And we need a bit more. If we scroll down and double click a command, we can see it's being used down here to actually run the command. So let's copy the execute line as well. And let's remove the printed message because instead of printing, we just ban the player. Then make sure it's all indented perfectly. Using shift tab, I am indenting those lines to the left. Okay, so we don't have server exposed here, so we need pself. And we also don't have the console, so we need the self. And instead of using a configurable bun time, we just hard code. Um, what is it? Is it seconds or is it uh, is it minutes? I don't know by heart. So let's uh, let's hard code. I, I never ban people, whatever. Let's hard code some ten in here. Well, instead of hard coding it, we can just also put it in here. And okay, so what's going on here? We define a variable that's the address string, and then we call a function get client address, which receives a client ID and a pointer to a string. So then the string will be filled with the address of the uh, client ID. So we don't use kick ID here, we use pcom context m underscore client ID, which is the person who executed the command. And then we use a variable a command down here, which we don't have defined. We could just use instead a buff, which is also a, a buffer that we defined up here. So um, that we have. Wonderful. So then we get the uh, IP address of the person who executed the command. We store it in a va variable a address string. Then we execute the command ban the IP address and then 10 minutes. I don't think it's seconds, never it's seconds. And then it says banned by vote. We could say another reason. For example, we say uh, too many login attempts. I don't know how long this message can be, to be honest. Um, and then we execute this line. And what console execute line does is essentially run it as it were run by a administrator in the admin console. And um, yeah, that's pretty convenient to uh, call the band code. Okay, uh, I have the feeling it doesn't build. Let's give it a try. It doesn't because uh, iGameController has no member console. So it seems like console is not defined in the iGameController class. So maybe it's defined in a game server. That's usually a good guess. Uh, and well, it is. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so this should now ban every player who exceeds two login attempts for like 10 minutes. So we have a similar rate limit as for the recon command. Okay, wonderful. Let's give it a try if it works. Um, so now if we try to log into foo and enter a wrong password, account does not exist. Didn't I register? Oh, well, do you know why it does not exist? Because I changed the storage location. Um, I mean, all the 
all the account files here won't be read uh, won't be read anymore because it expects the files to be in accounts let me quickly visualize it all the old accounts that i already created are like in this polluted directory and uh, it's now looking for accounts in the directory accounts which is empty um, so let's create some accounts let's register foo bar bar uh, what oh no so secure bar bass okay I can't create it. And now if I do a slash login uh, foo wrong password, it says wrong password. If I do it again, uh, I have two login attempts now. If I do a third one, uh, I will be banned uh, after the third one, right? So now I've been banned for like 10 minutes. Okay, it's minutes, not seconds. Awesome. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. So we kind of secured the brute forcing a bit. Um, yeah. So that's it for this episode. Um, yeah, I encourage you to do some research on your own and think about it. Hey, what code could be used uh, maliciously? How could a user break my account system? What could go wrong um, before rolling it out in some production server? Okay, okay. Chill Dragon from the future here. A few days passed and I noticed that I forgot to talk about something very crucial. Uh, don't confuse me forgetting about it and it being at the end of the video with it being not important. It's actually pretty crucial. And the issue is that we don't stop users from logging into an account that's already logged in. So multiple players can log into the same account at the same time. And that can cause serious trouble. As you can see, we have our login uh, function here that covers the code when a player executes the login command and there's no check for, hey, is this account logged in already? And if you code stuff, nothing happens from alone. You have to explicitly type out everything that you want to happen. So um, what's the issue? The issue is in our case, for example, players could lose level. How does it work? I will give you a simple example. Um, let's say I have an account that is level three and I share it with some friend. Then um, I join the server. I make some kills. I reach level 10. So far, so good. Then my friend joins the server while I'm still connected and I'm still logged in. So in the memory, in the account data struct, my level is 10, but in the file, it's still level three since I didn't disconnect yet and we only write to the file or disconnect. That means when my friend now logs in, he loads level three, which the account was initially when I logged in. So I load level three, I level up to 10, he loads level three, but since he's a noob, he doesn't do any kills, so he doesn't level up. Then I leave the game, which means I will write level 10 into the file. And then my friend leaves the game, which means he has currently level three in his account data struct, which he will also write to the file. But he leaves after me, so he will just overwrite level 10, and then the account will be level three, which means that the next time a user logs in, whether it's my friend or me, the account will be level three and it will not be level 10. And yeah, that's bad, but it can actually be even worse if you think about it. Let's say um, we had some currency and you could gain money on leveling up and you can send this money around. What you can do is you can send another person money while two accounts are logged in then you disconnect, the other person receives the money, uh, you disconnect, so uh, you lost the money, it will be saved to a file. Then the other user who is also logged in in your account disconnects after you and he didn't send any money. That means you essentially duplicated money. And uh, yeah, that's bad. Well, it, you can duplicate money in our uh, modification since we don't have money. But yeah, you definitely want to make sure that users cannot log into the same account at the same time. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we just have to kind of store in our account file whether the account is logged in right now or not. Okay, how do we do that? Um, well, since you can't edit lines, you can just overwrite the whole file. We just have to overwrite the whole file when a player logs in and change some value in there. So let's say in the last row of our account file, we have a zero or a one, depending on whether a player is logged in or not into that account. So when a player disconnects, we want to write one more line at the end. Uh, so we do a IO write. 
and um, the value that we write is a zero and it says um, is logged in or something like that. <clears throat> then we need also a new line in between here. Okay, so now our account file includes the values uh, username, then the password, then the XP, then the level, and then a zero or one, which indicates whether the account is logged in or not. And every time a player disconnects, we write a zero in here. And then we actually want to do the same thing um, when a player logs in. So in the login command, we also, when it successfully logged in, we also want to update the whole file. So we just paste in the whole code from the file saving and put in a one in here. <clears throat> so then when a player logs in, we read all the data and then we write all the data again back and we write a one at the end of the file, which indicates that the user is currently logged in. So um, we definitely have to change a few values here. P player, or oh, we also have this variable. Uh, we need a P self in here because we are now in a static method. And bum, 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 bum. we already have a file handle, so remove that. We probably also have a buffer already. Okay, so remove that buffer variable. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, we can say something else here. Set account logged in or something like that in the in the debug message. Um, yeah, that looks fine to me. Okay. So what now essentially happens, a user logs in, we read the file, and then we load it in our account struct. And directly after that, we write the account struct back to the file. But at the last line, we write a one, so um, we mark the account as logged in. Also make sure that you don't forget to also write it on register, where we create the initial account file in here in you know command register. Uh, we also write XP level and we also need to write in um, the is logged in. So we say is logged in and it's zero uh, because when we create a fresh account, we don't auto log in. So the account is not logged in and um, we set it to zero. So now we persist state whether the account is logged in or not. And the next step is to check the state and abort login when the account is logged in already. So where do we do that? Over here. This is where we read the last line of the account file. The level used to be the last line and we get it with linereader.get. So if we call linereader.get again, we get whether the account is logged in or not. We should move that uh, actually a bit higher um, but yeah, let's, let's keep it messy. <laughs> so we do a check if a toy, since it's uh, either a zero or one, we want to convert it to an integer. Lyreader.get is unequal to zero. So if the account is locked in already, we want to return. And since we already loaded a bit of data, we also want to revert that. So we set the username um, to an empty string again. Um, I'm not sure if we should count it as a login attempt, uh, whatever, let's not count it as a login attempt. Then we also want to um, clear out the XP and the level that we loaded. And we also want to yell at the user and say, Account already logged in. Okay. So far so clear, right? Yeah, it's a bit messy how we read line for line and when we abort, we have to revert those values, but that's how it is. Uh, you can also reorder it and move the is logged in in the file above the XP and the level, then we don't have to reset it. But setting it to zero here is kind of important since 
let's say the account is logged in already and another user tries to log in, we load a level here and um, well, when the login fails, we don't want to have this user to actually load this level, so we have to revert it back to zero. Um, yeah, so that is that. Okay, so uh, let's give it a try, if it even compiles. And it built, wonderful. So let's run the server. I would actually run it with a debugger, so GDB. I mentioned that in a previous debugger episode, I think. SV underscore server, game type my mod. Uh, you can also, if you're on Windows, run it with uh, Visual Studio debugger or whatever, because I'm expecting a crash. So let's have a look. Why am I expecting a crash? So let's log into some account that I created off screen that's called Chiller, and we do login Chiller test. As you can see, the server crashed. And if we have a look at the backtrace, um, ba -ba, log in, we crash in the file game controller CPP at line 1349. So let's have a look. Uh, 1349. And it's this line. So what could possibly go wrong here? Um, Atroy is probably a safe function, even if you give it garbage, that shouldn't fail. So it's probably the linereader.get that fails. And if you think about it, what does linereader.get do is it reads a line from the file. And if you call it again, it reads the next line. But the issue is that the account chiller that I was logging into is a old account. So that old account does not have this line yet, whether the account is logged in or not. So if you have legacy accounts and you add a new row to your account system, this code will crash. So you have to make sure that you update all the accounts that you have or write um, accordingly the code more stable. But uh, let's not do that for simplicity's sake. Um, let's have a look at the account file. And as you can see, my username is Chiller, my password is test and I have like 42 kills and uh, 21 level. And there's a line missing that states whether I'm logged in or not. So let's add a zero down here and save the file and run the server again. Now it shouldn't crash anymore. Just wanted to show this crash because, well, if you update your existing account system and you already have accounts, well, you're expected to run into a crash. So that's how you fix it and figure it out. So let's log into our account, chiller test and it says logged in, wonderful. If we now connect a dummy and try to log in again, we shouldn't be able to do so. So we do login chiller test and it says account already logged in because it tries to read the file, uh, which now if we look into the file accounts uh, chiller, you can see the last line is now a one because it's currently logged in. And if we then disconnect, and look at the file again, it's a zero now, because on disconnect, we write a zero, and on login, we write a one. So now we are able to log in again, and everything works fine. Keep in mind that we kind of have heavy code duplication here. So all this writing code that we do on login now is the same code that we have on um, disconnect. Well, as you probably noticed, since we copied it over and we barely had to change anything to make it work. The only difference really is that this is a zero and over there it's a one. So to write better code and for easier maintainability, you definitely want to uh, extract that into its own function. But well, since this video is long enough already, um, I decided to write ugly code that we can just uh, quickly scaffold down. Uh, but yeah, you should definitely refactor that. Maybe in some future episode, I will have a look at refactoring our code. Um, but yeah, for now you have to, if you update your account system to have more values, update it in two places. Uh, every value that you save and load has to be written twice and uh, read once. So, well, that's a lot of maintain effort, but uh, yeah, that's how it is. Um, but yeah, definitely important step. Make sure that your accounts cannot be logged in by multiple users at the same time and uh, also test it. There's actually one more pitfall. You have to make sure that the account is never marked as logged in when the user is actually not logged in. 
you might think we covered that, but let's think of a case. So for example, if I, uh, I'm logged in right now, yes I am. So the account is marked as logged in, we have a one here. What happens if I now go to the server, so this is my server, and I press Ctrl C to kill the server. So if I open the account again, it's zero. Why is it zero? Because if a server is uh, interrupted with Ctrl C, it will cleanly shut down, disconnect all the uh, players that are connected, and then it will update the state in the file as well. So that's fine. But for example, if the server crashes and it does not shut down cleanly or your computer reboots or however, so if the server shuts down without disconnecting players, this file won't be updated. And then in your file system, you still have a one and uh, the players are actually not logged in. So they won't be able to log in ever again, unless you manually edit this file and update all uh, ones to zeros. So yeah, just keep in mind that this can happen and if your server crashes or similar, your account state might be messed up and users cannot log in again. A possible fix for that is when the server launches, you iterate over all the files, all the account files and update them and set them to logged in zero because when a server freshly starts, uh, there cannot be any player logged in. As long as you only have one server, but uh, yeah, I'm not going into details of all the pitfalls that can ever happen here. Um, just keep that in mind. Um, you might have to edit account files manually if you're an administrator and you have like uh, a broken server with crashes, um, or you might wanna implement it to automatically do that on uh, a server restart. Okay, so now that we covered multiple users being logged in into one account at the same time, let's have a look at one user being logged into multiple accounts at the same time. So kind of the other way around. And well, nothing as of right now stops us from logging into account A and then executing login command again and logging into account B. What happens then is that account A is not properly logged out. And when we disconnect, we only save account B, which means that account A is still marked as logged in and will never be logged out. So users cannot log into that account uh, anymore. So we want to make sure that a user cannot log in uh, twice, like multiple times per session. Well, um, that's kind of unlucky. So if you want to switch accounts, you have to reconnect. But hey, if you feel adventurous, you can implement a logout command yourself. It's just copying the code we have from the disconnect and calling the command logout and you're pretty much done. Anyways, so uh, let's go and make sure that the user cannot log in if he's logged in already. So down here where we have the player variable, we can read out if the player is logged in already. And we do that in the if statement. So what we do is we check p player, then we access the m underscore account data. And in here we have the variable username and if the first character of the username is set, that means that the account is logged in. Because every time we log in, we set the username and if the first character is set, it means it has a value. And every time we log out or when a player starts newly uh, and is not logged in yet, we make sure that the first character of the username is uh, set to a null byte. As you remember, it's defined in player.h and um, in here, so if this line is executed, we execute the constructor and there we wipe out the username. And uh, yeah, so if the username is, well, unequal to a null byte, uh, which is the same as just like this, because any character is true, um, then the user is logged in. So if the user is logged in, we yell at the user and tell the user that you are logged in already. And we can say something like, you are already logged in. Okay. Okay, nice. So now that we covered all the cases that I could think of that could go wrong, um, this account system is ready to use from my side. Doesn't mean that we covered all the cases that could ever go wrong in existence of time. And this code is unhackable and unbreakable. But yeah, um, I, I tried my best to make this a functional account system that is actually ready to be used. So yeah, uh, have fun with that and uh, see you in the next episode.